Hi friends and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Marie with Living Felt, uh, Felting Supplies and FeltingTutorials.com. We today are talking about spring cleaning your felting or fiber art studio. This topic was supposed to be shared on our live show this week, but there were some technical difficulties, so we're recording it to share it with you right now. Our goal is to help you get your studios cleaned, organized, and refreshed for a really fun and creative year. And hey, just season. Spring is a great, great time. There's so many inspirational ideas for spring, but it would help a lot if your studio is ready for you and you are ready for your studio. So we're going to break this down into three easy steps. The first thing we're going to do is declutter then we're going to clean and then we're going to put away. So notice that the first thing or notice that I didn't say that really sexy word of organize. I find that we all can get really caught up in seeing these beautiful Instagram pages or these inspiring Pinterest images where everything is just beautifully orderly and sorted, but we want to jump from where we are, which might be a messy cluttered space to that, you know, oh, <laughs> rays of sunshine coming off the most beautiful craft pantry you've ever seen. And we can't get from here to there without doing our decluttering first and our cleaning and our organizing. But we're going to break that down into real easy steps for you too. Before we do, I want to talk just a little bit about how clutter happens. I know how it happens for me because I've really given this some thought. I found that there are spaces in my life where I am really organized, where I always put away what I just used and the place is ready for the next session. And that, for example, is my kitchen or my living room is always pristine and clean, but my studio can get a bit cluttered. And in asking myself, why does this happen? I realized that I will put things on a surface or put things on a shelf or maybe even put it on a bin when I don't know what to do with it. Perhaps I don't know whether I want to keep it. Perhaps I don't know when I want to finish it. Perhaps I don't really know where it goes or as I've really experienced in the last, uh, I don't know, few years, my rate of accumulation or acquisition has outpaced my reorganization or system for putting things away. So wherever you are in your space, even if it's really messy and disorganized, I want to encourage you to be kind to yourself. Don't beat yourself up. We're going to start very easy, small baby steps. And the first thing we're going to do is start with the declutter. Okay, so our very first step is to declutter. Decluttering is actually really easy and I want to encourage you to take it in these super baby steps. Give yourself a 15 minute increment or a 30 minute increment to just declutter one area. It could literally be one bookshelf or one cabinet drawer section. It could just be your work table or your cutting table, wherever you store stuff. Like just pick one spot and begin there and you only need a few things to do it. The first is a box or a basket to either donate or gift. Um, the second thing is you need recycle bag for anything you can recycle and a trash bag for anything that is literally toast and just doesn't belong in your space anymore. And then the last part is a parking space for anything that you're going to keep. But these items, donate gift, um, trash recycle, and actually you need one more parking space and that's for stuff that you're going to sell. So that could be a box, a bin, or a portion of the table. But let's just start to separate everything into those areas. I'm really fortunate in that I work with a lot of gals who are also very creative and artistic and also felt. So one of the first things I do is when I'm ready to get rid of stuff is I gather it up and I put it in my to-go bag, which is this basket has hauled many things <laughs> that I want to gift. So like this fun piece of tile from my <laughs> renovation project, I'm going to donate that to Holly because she's a sign maker. This little bin, which I bought because I thought it was cute, is really not my favorite. So I'll see if anybody wants it. I'm kind of over the metal, the metal, some uh, silks that really aren't for me, my style, some books that somebody else might appreciate. All of these things I put into my donate basket. I actually even went to Goodwill this morning and dropped some stuff off and here is my donation receipt. So I hope that you'll share your donation receipts if you give stuff away. So I gift or donate, I recycle everything I can 
I trash everything that doesn't make sense. And then lastly, I sell very, very little. Like something has to be just too good to donate to sell. Like I recently sold a loom that I have a lot of really good intentions for and never used, or maybe a sewing machine or something like that. So pick one spot, give yourself one small area, one small increment of time, and sort it into these categories. Gift or donate, recycle or trash, sell, or keepers. At the end of your session, the only thing that should be left are the keepers. So what I want to encourage you to do is at the end of your session, whether it's a day or a weekend, but don't let it be a week unless you're not leaving the house. So at the end of a session, a day or a weekend, scurry these items away with you and remove them from your space because every little step that you take to get that clutter out you're going to have more clarity, more calmness, less stress, and less stuff to think about. So begin with a little space and start your declutter. After you have your all your items that are going away out of your space, except for your keepers, the next thing we need to do is actually clean the space. And again, I'm talking about like one bookshelf at a time, if that's all you can handle, two if you can handle more, one set of drawers, your top, any little increment of space that you can get yourself brave enough to just start, start. But before you put anything back, we really wanna clean the space. So we're gonna break this down into cleaning surfaces and then cleaning the stuff, like our felted stuff, uh, fiber stuff, whatever art, clothing, wearables, anything like that. For cleaning your space, one of your best friends is going to be your vacuum. I really want to say that the key to unwanted guests is cleanliness. <laughs> I really thought about that because in our art form, there's really risk of pests getting into your fiber stash or getting at the items you felted. And if we keep a clean space, we are 99% of the way there. And so this is regular cleaning, but we're talking about spring cleaning. So for spring cleaning, I don't want you to pull out your feather duster. You want to get out your vacuum and you want to get up, under, and behind everything. So the very tops of your shelves, at the baseboards, in the crevices of your shelves, and in the trims of your doors, in the trim, the base trim, underneath the carpet, um, and behind everything on the shelf. So that's why everything needs to come off. If you vacuum, you're going to remove stuff that you don't want to be there. Not just dust, um, but little critters or bugs and their eggs or larvae. Vacuum up and empty your vacuum bag so you get that out or whatever. You can you rinse these things all the way. So that's the first step. You also, when you clean, I want to encourage you to use cleaners that are good for you, good for your respiratory system, and also good for the environment. These are the two cleaners that we use here at Living Felt and my home. The first one is BioClean. It's definitely more expensive. I think we pay on average $7.99 to $8.99 a bottle. We all love it because it smells just like lavender, and we use a lot of lavender. I've been using this one since, uh, this is kind of like the pandemic, <laughs> this, this was really hard to get and every time it was delivered it leaked. Every time they would cancel our delivery. I buy this at Whole Foods, it costs like $3.99 and then we add lavender to it. So um, some of you know that moths don't like the scent of larva, specifically clothes moths is what we're talking about, don't like the scent of lavender. Did I just say that? <laughs> Sounded like I said something else. They don't like lavender, so you can just buy this unscented and put lavender in it. More recently, I also found it with lavender and it was a true lavender. So don't go for the fake stuff. If you buy it at the regular grocery store, it probably doesn't have true essential oils in it, or it has maybe a little essential oils and some fragrance. The fragrance isn't gonna do you any good against the critters or for your respiratory system. So go for unscented if you need to and use regular lavender in your cleaning. Um, but you know, moths and moth larvae aren't our only concern. There are other critters in our environment that like our textiles. 
they like cotton they like silk they like viscose some of them even like rayon some of them even like paper so the cleaner you can keep your space the less likely you'll have to combat those guys but i wanted to mention that um, carpet beetles which are actually really common by the way and they like pollen i uh, understand so they're going to come in on people's clothes you're going to start to see them around springtime they don't like eucalyptus so think about wiping your baseboards uh, with eucalyptus and you know just consider getting like a nice microfiber cloth once you've vacuumed if you get a microfiber cloth they actually pick up bacteria as well as stuff but they have real um, grippy little bits to them you can feel because the way they grip your fingers so a microfiber cloth is really good because it's going to take with it a lot of the things that you wipe so the cleaning is really important before you put your stuff back and regular routine cleaning is really important make sure you're vacuuming your car Carpets, all your baseboards and just take all that stuff away I feel like there was something else I was going to tell you about um, cleaning your space but if you have questions I hope you'll um, leave them down below and let us know how we can help with that the only thing I wanted to mention is that there's a variety of critters that like stuff that may impact your textiles that don't eat your textiles so for example like um, crickets and silverfish also like starch and so if you have items that are starch they're not necessarily protected that would be attracted to them and if they munch on that they'll damage your fiber if you have dirty things around that need to be washed some critters are attracted actually to the soil they'll go after the soil or even food stains and then damage your linens or your felted items trying to get after that so cleanliness is your goal once we clean our space we also want to clean our items before we put them away for the winter so for us, it's starting to warm up here in Central Texas. It may be warming up where you are as well. So our scarves, our cowls, maybe a winter hat, or maybe even your holiday items, it's time to clean them and put them away. Some things that are more durable like this, you can dust. You might be able to, uh, like if you have a wall hanging, you might be able to vacuum it gently. For something like this, you can brush it. Um, you can even brush it with a brush like this if it's not too uh, coarse. This is a horsehair brush and you can brush items off of it. So you want to get all the dust off and if you think you have any kind of um, infestation at all, if you start to see little munch holes in your stuff, uh, there's disagreements about the effectiveness of either freezing or sunshine you can actually bake things like this at a very high temperature over I think it's 140 degrees for 30 minutes um, and you can also wash them a hat like this if it's washed would need to be reblocked so you would only want to wet or wash something that you could reshape and block otherwise you can brush it and take off anything that might be left you can also have items dry cleaned which is one of the best ways to take care of it and and then put it away and we'll deal with that organization and put away in just a moment something like this this is actually really well felted and can also be brushed um, it can be dusted vacuumed this little removable hat could be hand washed again so whatever you have whether it's a scarf your slippers um, a throw anything that you felted or whether it's felted or linen or cotton whatever you have now is a really great time to get all of that cleaning done so brushing is one hand washing is another we have this wonderful product by the great folks over at unicorn fiber um, there is a beyond fiber wash this is really for washing your gentle items like your scarves and your wearables maybe even a throw or a blanket and this is beyond soft which is really going to help reduce static give it a nice feel and this is totally optional you can wash with this you can dry clean you can use the same olive oil soap that you felted something with um, but you can wash with this and you don't necessarily have to do a vinegar treatment after because this stuff is really really gentle on your fiber so just a little bit hand washing and warm water is fine as long as you're just cleaning again if you feel like you have um, any kind of critters in your stuff I encourage you to do more research on the internet because you're gonna have to wash hotter or you could dry clean that would definitely solve the issue so let's clean our space let's clean our stuff before we put it away and that's really going to be the key to protecting your stash and taking care of its health as well as yours too let's look at some ideas for organizing your fiber 
in the past, uh, what I used to do is store my fiber open on a shelf, kind of like we have behind here. Like all of my fiber was open, just like this. I had my MC1 by color, and then I started adding more Merino top by color, and I didn't want them together. What I found was I was using like these shoe cubby organizers that I was overstuffing the cubbies. I couldn't see what was behind. I had so much fiber out and on display that I didn't even know what I had because things were buried deep. The cubbies are pretty deep. And I found that I really needed to break it down into smaller increments. And the best thing for me was to go to these plastic bins. Now I know some people don't like to store their fiber in plastic, but my pitch for it is that it's repeatable, it's stackable, you can see through it, it's easy to label, and you can have it be bug proof. So really, you don't want things crawling in and out of your fiber storage. And critters are just part of life. They just are. Whether it's silverfish or whatever else, they, they just kind of come when you don't really expect it. So for me, this is a really guaranteed way to keep my stuff clean. And if you get gifted something from someone or you buy something at a fiber show and you're not sure about it, it's a way you can sort of quarantine and observe how's it doing as well. This is how I organize my stuff. For my main fiber families, like my Merino Top, my MC1, anything else, I store fiber by family and by colorway. So this guy right here is just my Merino Top hot bin. I just label it on one side because that's all that's displayed. And this is a selection of colors that I have here. You might keep a reference of what you have, but for me, this allows me to see everything that I have available, and then I actually use this to shop. What do I, I can see everything at once, and if I have more fiber than will fit in a single layer, then I will add another tub. So for example, my earth tones and all my fibers, I always have at least two tubs of earth tones because there's so many to choose from, and I like to have a wide breadth of them. But this is how I store them, so it's by fiber type, and then by color family. So this is all Merino top, 19.5 micron, and my MC1 batting looks the same. My bling fibers are a little different. And my bling fibers, I choose these little narrow, these are actually like, uh, these are art bins. This one is from, you can get the large shoe box at the container store, or I'm pretty sure that I got these at Home Depot. Um, because I felt like they closed a little better. But I think this is the large shoe or boot box from the container store. Measure the depths of your shelves because you'll be glad if you have something that isn't very deep, much deeper than your shelves are. This is a scrapbook box by the Art Bins, and I like it because it's small, and this is how I store my embellishment or bling fibers, as we like to call them. I like them because the reason I chose these, it's the Recollections line, is because I wanted something that didn't stack. I wanted it to go sideways because I have a lot of these and I wanted to be able to pull them out like a binder or a book and that's how I stack them across. I took a little picture, I'll see if I can share it. But so the way we ship our fibers, we sell our embellishment fibers or bling fibers in small increments if you wanna get a lot of candy packs. And then this way I can see everything that I have available. And I don't necessarily store it by color by type. I just go color in the range of things I have, color in the range of things I have. And sometimes people have given me little things like this actually, interestingly enough, this is one of the first fiber gifts I ever received and it's hand spun merino by somebody who drove to meet me when I very first started publishing. Yeah, I still have it. I, I, it's almost hard for me to use it because it's just so precious. So I have a few pieces of that. And other things, so you can keep them all in these bins. I like them again because it's a single layer and I can see everything I have. And this is an art bin and I think that it's about a 15 inch uh, bin and they all stack up. This is another art bin right here and I use this for my fabric. And so you can see that everything is labeled so that when I'm only looking at this end of something, I know what's in there. These are some silk fabrics. Uh, I have a lot of purples and stuff, so this bin doesn't have a whole, whole lot in it. It's got a little less than some others, but these have little dividers in them that you can use and then I separate the different fabrics. And then if it's just too big, there's still room to put some stuff on top. 
So this is like a jumbo art bin. Now these are kind of expensive solutions, but they, these art bins are kind of expensive, but they do work for me. I like them. These are less expensive. And then the last is another, this is a tall box that Holly uses here. Holly does this, oh, does this. Holly does a lot of our merchandising in the store and creates a lot of our displays. She does the wall behind me, <laughs> is really good at it. And she manages a bunch of little parts and cute little things. And she wanted these tall bins also from the container store. Holly will like likes to label hers in clear and then she labels the lid and she labels this so no matter what she's looking at she can see it. Um, and these tall bins, I don't know what these are called but they're from the container store and I think you can buy them in, in sets. We like to label all these things and I'll show you that but I also want to show you some cheaper things you can use to organize your stuff. And Push comes to shove. These right here are just these little Sterlite uh, shoe boxes. This costs a dollar eighteen from Home Depot. That's it, lid included. This one is stuffed full with our MC1, so they're a little full, hard to close it exactly flush with these big two ounce bundles in there. But it would fit the little packs really well. So this is only less than a dollar and a quarter. You can get a ton of these and fill up your shelves in your studio. These little trays, I love to use trays in drawers. I love to use trays on shelves. And these little trays are from Ikea. Uh, they cost, I think, $4 and change. So anything you want to store or organize by bins, these are really good for that. And this is called uh, uh, Kugis, K-U-G-G-I-S, uh, from Ikea. You can buy a ton of these if your stuff is packaged and you just want to have it out and be able to see it. And lastly, we all get these free sort of free bins maybe when you buy linens a pillow uh, new sheets new towels sometimes a purse or something will come in a little zipper bag so this is a non-woven bag and it has this little vinyl front but what i like about it is it's absolutely not accessible to anyone you don't want to get in there because it has a zipper and it's not just open so think about this as whenever you get these, just save them back because they're absolutely free. So all of these are ideas for organizing your pieces and parts, your stuff, your supplies. You can also just have little bags um, or little jars. Like if you just have serious scraps and you don't know what to do with them, save them back. And I'm gonna show you something you can do with your scraps here in a minute. But like this is a scrap jar of fine fibers, merino. So pretty just to have on the shelf. You can have these in several colors and then you can just pluck from them whenever you want. Likewise, sometimes when I'm working on a project, I end up with little bits or sometimes I make little bit bags so that I can just sit and needle felt and pull from a bit bag. So I actually keep bit bags bigger than this actually, by color family accessible so that if I don't need to go into my big bin of MC1, I only do it for MC1, then I have a little bag I can go to and grab a little black, grab a little gray, grab a little white, brown, whatever. So think about having some little bit bags that are readily accessible too. And then um, the last thing would be how to store your wearables that you're putting away for the winter. Let's look at that. Once you've washed your stuff, you really want to put it away someplace that's safe. So I recommend storing it in your closet or in your room, somewhere that's attractive. If you don't have drawer space, that's going to be pleasing for you, but that isn't in a non-climate controlled space. So here, if we store stuff in our garage in a bin, it's going to get musty because it gets very humid and hot here in the summertime. So I have found these boxes on Amazon. I meant to get the link for you. I'll try and include that in the description, but these boxes boxes on Amazon are really great because they're truly square, not the fake square stuff that they show you sometimes. It has a little Velcro lift so it's not sealed. I also have ones that zipper that I put like my big scarves away in. They're non-woven and they zipper close. I'll see if I can find that link also. But this is for things, um, my smaller things. So after you wash your stuff, you can wash like your, um, your cowls, your scarves and things like that. I like to then uh, hand wash these and dry them. I like to store them in a bag and sometimes I store them with a card on them that reminds me 
where they came from or what they were. So like this one is special and that's why it has a card. It was a gift from my friend Charity Vandermeer. She made this shawl and gifted it to me. So if something happens to me but the scarf survives, someone will know where it came from. If somebody actually you know gets to inherit it, I will always know where it came from. But this way, just if it happens to go into someone else's hands, they will know what happened to it. So after it's washed, after it's dried, I store it away in a little bin like this because it looks cute in the top of my closet. And if you have things that are not in plastic but maybe they're zippered and just kept from the other critters, add your little lavender bags. We made these little sachets together a few Wooly Wednesdays ago. I think it was the beginning of um, this year, 2021. And if you don't hand sew your own, then you can just, we sell lavender in a bag or any lavender you can get. You can always refresh your lavender bags just by giving them a squeeze. So remember your, some of our critters aren't really gonna like those and this will keep your stuff smelling fresh and sweet. If you want to label your bins when you put them away, to show you, this is the this is the label maker we use. It's the Dymo label maker. I'll share a link because I don't know exactly what the details are, but it's really cool. You can even use USB functions with it. Uh, pair it to your computer and control what you put there. It has lots of different styles. So I noticed that the gals here all use different styles or different size of ribbons. We also use an off-brand ribbon because it's a little bit cheaper and we can buy it in bulk. So I'll share that with you. But if you invest in a label maker, I promise you're gonna find that you start to really even desire to get more organized and it's gonna make it easier to find everything that you have. You don't have to dig through stuff just to find what you're looking for. So this is a really good investment for home, office work. We have two, one at my house and one here too, because we had to have it. So I hope that's helpful to for storing your stuff. Just some ideas. We've also shared some more recently in our newsletter and more in our Facebook group. So check out our Facebook group and search Wool Storage because some people have shared some really fun ideas as well as ideas of the way that they organize their references, their color references. Um, but let's just take a quick look at a way you can use some of your real scrappy scraps and turn them into, you could call them kitchen sink bats or I call them trash bats that you can use for the core of your needle felting projects. Okay, so now we're gonna look at a fun thing you can do with some of your super scraps. And I mean really scrappy scraps. To be honest with you, I didn't even know how we get these little super teeny tiny bits, but I think they come from workshops. And what happens is at the end of workshops, there's always this stuff left. But it's been a while since we've had workshops, so I don't know how we have this tiny stuff, but I will tell you that some of it came from my house because sometimes I just end up with these little bits and I don't wanna put it back. I don't. I don't want to go put it back in the bin where I store all the stuff. It becomes a scrap. And if I don't have, now I have the color family bags, which I didn't have before. But if you end up with these really scrappy stuff, you don't know what to do with it, you can make what I call trash bats. And these are examples of trash bats. Now you need a drum carter for this or hand cards if you know how to use them. They're really loose and they're really chunky, but they make great innards for stuff. I know that I have a couple of pin cushions here where these were the bottoms. So instead of core wool, you can use these really fun bits. You can also use these for stuffing. And once you card them, they get from this chunky, funky stuff to something a little more smooth and would stuff something more easily, whether it's a pillow or a, a stuffed toy. And just for fun, I'm going to show you how to um, card it on this drum carter. This is one of our Ashford uh, drum carters. It is the eight inch. I originally got the 12 inch for my home studio and found that this was the size I preferred. The 12 inch is wider. I love the eight inch drum carter, quite honestly. And we even have an electric 20 inch one. I still love this one better. It's not by Ashford, it's by someone else. I still love this one better because it's so easy to use. So I'm gonna crank up just a couple of trash bats for you or one trash bat for you, just so you can see how it goes. This is the stuff, it's a real mess. It's super chunky. There's nothing uniform about it. Um, you can even get little bits of string and stuff. I would say about the locks because you might find other use for the locks. Um, but here's what we're going to do. Okay, so I'm going to be putting the fiber right here on the feeder plate. And we put things just, these two little pegs here are just to keep the wool from going all the way to the edges. The reason that's important 
is um, it keeps, if you keep the fiber off the very edges, it keeps them from getting into the gears there. And I don't really have much problem with this particular drum card or that happening. This is a mishmash. I have neps in here. I can see um, some blend from our little bear episodes <laughs> in here. And I'm just gonna pile it on and not even break it up all that much. It's really not that important. This isn't clamped to the table. Normally we clamp it down. Um, so I'll just hang on to it, do my best, so it doesn't jump around on us, which it will. Here we go. Okay. I have it up on a little riser so that I can show you how we do this. Let me pull it back a little bit, and there we go. I'm going to put some more stuff on the feed-in tray right here. This brush helps get everything laying down onto the drum. This is the drum. This is the liquor end. The liquor end pulls up the fiber and puts it onto the drum and the brush helps getting get it to lay down. This is going to be much more chunky than if you're blending other fibers and we're going to blend some fibers together, some nice fine fibers together next week for felting onto later. So this brush helps hold things down. We can also use this brush as well to get everything laying down and I'll show you how we do that if I can, one-handed. These are just fun. When you start to um, fill them out, it's fun just to let the colors be whatever because it doesn't really matter. I have seen some fun projects where people make really interesting things from their little bits, but for me, this is kind of a fun thing. Get my, get my brush tied down. So we have a fun little bat going right there, and I'm just going to turn it a little bit so y'all can see. This is our bat as I roll it around, and the brush right here, which you can't see on this side, helps push this fiber down and get it a little more uniform. If you're trying to get your bats super smooth, you can also use this little brush, and that's going to be hard with my one-handed bits, but let me show you that. The brush just kind of gets everything a little more packed down. And that's what we kind of call it, a packer brush right there. Cool. So now that we have a basic bat, I have something that feels really thin right across this middle. You probably can't see it, but the reason that's important is it makes it easier to pull the um, it makes it easier to pull the bat off when that's even. So I'm going to run a little more fiber through here just so I kind of fill in that space and then we'll take it off the, we'll take it off the drum carter. Now you can do this by hand. It's just not going to create such a big bat. You'd make little tiny bats. There you go. So we have a nice little bat and what we want to do is take it off of the drum. To do that, they've designed this cool little groove here and this little pick. And what we're going to do is we put the pick right into that groove and then we do what's called breaking the bat. So you just pull up and because these are short fibers and it's chunky, we pull off these little bits. That's totally fine and expected. And we, we've broken the bat there, right there um, at that level. Usually when you card fibers, you can just fold this down and pull the fibers off real uniformly, but this is kind of chunky. So the helper is to use our little brush and coax them off. They see I got a lock in there. That's really fun. So I'm going to see if I can just hold her in place. Usually I like to pull tension right here and push this against the, see how it sticks. You can just use your brush. And usually you'll card a few of these at a time anyway. We're not expecting perfection from trash bats. We're just getting a little more, uh, we're just kind of breaking up those little chunks and turning them into something that's a little easier to work with. How fun is that? And we'll clean off the drum. When we're all done, 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 we'll clean off the drum. Um, but here's my little bat that I've made. I'll spread them out so you can see. That's the real pretty uniform side. There's the side that was on the drum. You can see how chunky and funky that is there. But then 
we just roll it up and it'll be ready for use. Now you can make these uh, with hand cards also, but what you're gonna see is it's only a hand carded piece is only gonna be like as long as you can get on your hand card. So this would be like from the small hand cards. Um, but consider saving your bits back, carding them up, whether you use them just for stuffing like they are, or if you have a drum card or, or a friend has a drum card, or grab your scrap bowl or your scrap bag, bring it over and make yourself some your, your own kitchen sink or trash bats. That's it for this time, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. We want you to um, share with us in our group, share your um, studio resets, share your mess, share the before, share the after, share your donation <laughs> slips, and uh, share your trash bats too. We'd love to see your organization. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. Be good to yourself.